Seen that movie? Holes, my wife has, and all. Nobody's ever seen that movie? Yeah, Chris has seen that movie. Yes, Barbara. Yeah. Read the book. It's a story about a basically just a real quick kid that a young kid that does a stupid thing gets in trouble with the law one time gets sent to this to this camp uh, reform camp a camp for troubled kids and it's out in the middle of a of a desert what used to be a lake and the lake was dried up and and it was just desert they hadn't seen rain there for years and years and years and it gets the title because every day they had to go out in the middle of this dried up lake and dig holes. They had to dig holes. They didn't have any idea what they were digging holes for. Well, the the uh, there was a story about a bank robber who had buried buried their treasure out in the middle of this dried up lake. And so the uh, warden of this lake was having them go out there and dig holes every day, hoping they'd eventually discover this gold. And anyway. But at the end of the movie, there's so many things that have happened, doesn't matter. At the end of the movie, all everything's been made right, all the wrong that was wrong had been set straight, everything had been taken care of, and suddenly there comes a thunderstorm, and the, it just begins to pour down. Those of you who've seen that movie, you remember that at the end. And, and these kids, these teenagers, uh, the adults, everyone, they've been, they've been every day, they've had a bottle of water that sustained them as they worked out there digging on those holes. But they they're out in the streets, they're dancing and they're partying and they're just soaking in the rain. Holy Spirit, rain down. That's where I'm at right now. I'm just saying, Lord, pour out your spirit. Let the wind, the, the heavens be open and let there be an outpouring, God, that we can just stand as it were and party in the presence of the Lord. Can I get an amen this morning? That's my desire. That's above everything else, just for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask our ushers, if they can, to come this morning. We want to give you an opportunity to, to give today. Thank you for, the, uh, for your faithfulness. Joe, can you come help us this morning with the offering, please? I'd appreciate it very much. Hallelujah. Father, we come this morning just so thankful for your provision into our lives still, every day. Father, as much as we long for the heavens to be open spiritually, yet, Lord, we see your faithfulness. We know week after week, day after day, that you have not abandoned us, you've not left us. Father, your provision financially, spiritually, physically sustains us. But yet, Lord, we cry out for more. Lord, not for more financially. That's always a blessing. It's wonderful. But God, what we really want is the outpouring, an unprecedented outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. God, I pray that in these people, Lord, this congregation, Father, that you've put me here to pastor and to lead. I'm asking you, Lord, in their presence, in their hearing, I'm asking you to begin to stir in them a thirst and a hunger and a desire for you more than ever before in their lives. Not just to be content with a little here and there, but, Lord, to begin to pray in their prayer times, in their seeking you, God, for an outpouring of of the re heavenly rain, Lord, upon us. But Father, we come today to bring you our tithes and our offering to give you thanks and to give you praise for what you are doing in our lives, knowing that you have not abandoned us, you have not forgotten us. And Lord, we give today with thanksgiving and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <coughs> Excuse me for that. Over the past several weeks, I've been preaching about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this rain of the Holy Spirit. I began with talking about let it rain. Just let it rain. We need to be soaked in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and overflowing with the Spirit in our lives. We preached last week a message entitled Something New. God is wanting to do something new. And I, I had a different title for my message. And, and when I got 
done, I looked at it, was reviewing it. You know what? This is just really part two of last week's message. God wants to do something new. I, I believe he wants to give us something fresh in our lives personally, but as well for us as a congregation. Uh, one, I, I feel that the Holy Spirit revival is beginning to move. I begin to sense a, a breeze, as it were, of the Holy Spirit. And as I was thinking about that this morning, I was reminded of a missions trip that I went on several years ago. Actually, uh, the most enjoyable missions trip I was ever on. Uh, it was down deep in Mexico, the deepest I'd ever been in Mexico at that point. Down in the mountains, it's called the Copper Mountains of Mexico. Mexico. And it's uh, uh, somewhat green. It's not like the northern Mexico, very, very dry and desert-like. But down there, deeper in the mountains, it's, it's uh, greener uh, pine trees and some streams down in the deep valleys. I remember as we went back to this place way back in the mountains, we drove along one of those places I'd seen in the movies where, I mean, there was literally room for one car that had been cut out in the side of the hill. And you wove around and, and literally at times there was wild wild uh, donkeys and cattle roaming and you'd meet a cow or a donkey and I'm not I'm not joking I'm not making this up you'd meet that that animal head on that animal would back up to a wide spot in the road and get over and let the cars go by because there was not room if you met another car you somebody had to back up to a wide spot every once in a while there'd be a wide spot but you drove and I was part of the time in the passenger seat and I drove that car looking over the edge it was, it, I, I loved it it was phenomenal it was neat but the best part of the trip back in these mountains we were in an undeveloped area there was a city close to a town let me say that in fact one of the oldest towns in Mexico the first town in Mexico to have a telephone uh, way back years ago it was a copper mining town and they actually had a, a, a telephone because they were so far removed it was the quickest and only way really to get communication in and out but we went down by the river a small river and camped literally camped in tents for a week while we were on this missions trip normally you go on a missions trip you stay in some place reasonably nice. I've stayed in some very nice motels on mission trips. I've stayed in dormitories in Bible college and mission trips, which are very comfortable as well. But we were camping out. We, my, myself and three other men from our church in Jack, Dexter had joined the church from Rolla, Rolla First Assembly of God. And uh, because I'd been youth pastor, I'd stayed youth uh, connected to them and went on mission trips with them regularly. But we had driven our church van from Dexter and had met them down near the, the uh, Mexican border there at, at El Paso, followed them down into Mexico and got down there and set up camp. Well, what I didn't know is because there were a number of them and only I think they had one or two vans. They didn't have a whole lot of room. So they were given some, some pretty strong restrictions on what they could bring for camping. Uh, most of them had fairly small tents where two or three of them would stay in a tent, usually just two. Not really a pup tent, but a fold-out small tent. Very very limited stuff they were able to bring. The church as a whole had brought a large tent to set up the kitchen in, set up generators, had no electricity, so they set up generators, ran some lights to run our tools during the day, and as well to power a pump that we drank water out of the river through a filtration system. So we drank from the river, we swam in the river, and we bathed, literally bathed in the river every day. And it was, I, I just had a tremendous time. I loved it that whole week. But they were very limited in what they were supposed to bring but they didn't tell us that us from First Assembly and Dexter so I'm a camper I love to go camping I have a big tent so I'd taken my big tent for the four of us we all had air mattresses to sleep on we had a, a very sizable screen tent that we put right up against the front of our other tent so we had kind of a porch out in front of our tent a screen tent that we could go in and out of and leave our shoes 
houses and, and you know keep the bugs out of our tent we the Royal Rangers had some collapsible plywood uh, picnic tables they weren't very big they were probably about five foot long but they came all apart they were you know cut and veed together you know the legs veed on the table and it was really neat and so we had a we had our table and we had a coffee pot and we had a, 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 a stove a little stove that we brought along and lawn chairs and, and the most important item at all when I go camping a large jar of peanut butter <laughs> I, you got to have peanut butter to live. That's just, you can't live without peanut butter. So anyway, when we got our camps, <laughs> I still picture it. We got our campsite set up. We were the mansion. We were the plantation owners among all the, uh, the peasants who had their little bitty tents scattered around. It was rather funny. So we were living, the four of us, living pretty high on the hog, as it were. We worked just as hard as everybody else. It wasn't, but it looked like a big deal. Well, every day at about 1, 2 o'clock, we would come back to, we would work on the building all morning. We'd come back to the campsite. They'd fix lunch. We'd take about a two-hour siesta. We'd swim in the river. We'd relax. Then we'd go back back and we'd work until dark and then come down and eat supper. Well, I don't remember if it was at lunch or if it was at supper time when we were around the camp. Calm, quiet time. I think it was in the evening. No sign of any storms. Nothing. And suddenly, I, I literally mean I've never seen this happen. Out of nowhere, this big wind just blows in. Just one huge gust of wind blows through the camp. Picks up our screen tent, dumps it in the river, and, and kind of messes up our whole campsite. Nothing else was damaged. Nothing else was touched. Just our campsite. It was as if God said, okay, enough of this pride stuff, buddy. You need to humble yourself just a little bit. Everybody thought it was hilarious. I'm not looking for a sudden blast of wind. I'm serious. It, it didn't continue to blow. It didn't rain. And it was just one whoosh. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was just like God went, blowed your tin over. Nah, 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 nah. You know? I'm longing for the outpouring of the Spirit. But I'm beginning to sense the breeze. You know, when a storm front's coming, usually there's a wind that begins to move in front. A slow, gentle breeze. And the closer the storm gets, the stronger the wind gets. A slow, gradual increasing. I believe that's what we're beginning to experience here. It's, I don't, I'm not looking for that gust of wind, that gust of the Holy Spirit that comes and something phenomenal happens and boom, it's over with and gone. I want that thing to move in slow and to stay and just camp out over us. One of those summer long, you know, or spring long rainstorms that last for a week or two. I just want the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us. And so that's what I'm continuing to preach about, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to begin this morning looking at John's Gospel, chapter 20. This message has been on my heart all week long since last Sunday. Maybe even before that, the Lord's been stirring it. I, I'm, I'm just, I hope I can preach this message properly because I, I'm just, I, 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 you ever want to say something and it just like it almost explodes out of you? You're just so excited. You've seen a kid and they just can't, that's where I'm at right now. I'm just so ready to share this message. But John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. Listen now. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Do you know where we're at? John chapter 20. This is after the resurrection. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Can, can you see the, the excitement that was beginning to well up in them? They see Jesus. It's the night of his resurrection. They have been in mourning for three days. That morning they had heard things from different ones. We've seen Jesus. Mary had seen Jesus. The men on the road to admit they had seen Jesus. But now suddenly he was in the room with them. And their excitement's bubbling. I can just... Oh, it's really 
really, it's you. It's you. And their excitement's just going. So he says again, peace be with you. Settle down. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice those words in verse 22. Receive the Holy Spirit. What, what did he mean by that? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to move just a, ahead a little bit in Scripture, yes, but a little bit in time. In Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. This is the book, of the, the writer Luke, the same one who wrote the, the Gospel of Luke, now writes this. And he says in verse 1, the first account, talking about the Gospel of Luke, the first account I composed Theophilus, whoever Theophilus was, that's who he was writing to, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So this is the opening words of this, this long story that, that Peter's, or excuse me, that, that Luke's going to tell, uh, that we know all about uh, the beginning of the church. But these words are setting the scene for where Luke picks up on the story, uh, right off, basically where we left off, where he's shown himself to the disciples in the first few days after his resurrection. But, but Luke says he continued to present himself over and over again over a period of 40 days so a little over a month different times he would show up just appearing before them with many signs with many proofs that hey I am really alive let's go on verse 4 Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? So he's trying to tell them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and they're worried about the coming of an earthly kingdom. So Jesus says in verse 7, It is not for you to know times or epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But listen, he says, this is what you need to hear. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. Father, we ask you this morning, Father, that you would anoint me and use me, Father, today. I pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is still saying to the church today today. Father, open our, our understanding fully and completely. God, may we not be closed in in any way, but Lord, may, may our hearts be made sensitive by the presence, the power, the reality of the Holy Spirit in this place this morning to hear and understand not what I say, but what the Word of God says to us today. Father, use me, I pray. Let me be a, a tool, a vessel, an instrument with nothing in myself but what you do through me, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, these words are very familiar to us, especially those who are in the Assemblies of God, part of Pentecostalism. Maybe you've grown up in, in a Pentecostal church. But there is something very, very interesting here, especially in light of the words that were spoken in the previous passage that we just read there in John on the day of Jesus' resurrection. Remember, what we read there in John was on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. It was not that morning. It was in the evening. But now what we're reading in Luke is 40 days later, a month, month and a half later. 
First of all, we realize the time that he speaks these words to them in Acts chapter 1. It's the day that he ascends to the Father, that he, that he leaves this earth. While he's talking with them, he's lifted up out of their presence and disappears into the cloud. But notice back in John 20, the night of his resurrection, Jesus had breathed on them, it said, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, 40 days later, on the day of his ascension, Jesus tells them that they will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If they received the Holy Spirit in the night of the resurrection, when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, why is he now telling them to wait to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Is there a difference in this receiving? Receiving the Holy Spirit, as he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Is there a difference between receiving and being baptized in the Holy Spirit? That's exactly what I want to show you, teach you, lead you through today as we look at God's Word. The difference between receiving the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. You may know this already, and it may be something new to you, but I, I'm not going to tell you from my perspective. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. First of all, receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of our salvation. We are saved by faith through, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' work on the cross brought us salvation. But the Holy Spirit comes as we know in John chapter 16 verse 7 8. He comes to convince the world, to convict the world of sin and of judgment and of righteousness. Remember that? that so the Holy Spirit even before we're saved comes to convince us of where sin is in our life he comes to convince us that there's a judgment that we're going to face for that sin because as he convinces us of this that we have fallen short of the righteousness of God then he begins to convince us of the truth of Jesus Christ John chapter 14 verse 16 and verse 26 where it says the Holy Spirit will to lead you into all all truth. The Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus Christ. Are you following me? Are you staying with me? It's not something we discover on our own. No man comes to the Father, but how? But by the Spirit. But by being drawn to the Holy Spirit. So number one, as an agent of salvation, he convicts us of sin. He reveals the truth of Jesus Christ. And then... The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us new birth. It is the Holy Spirit that gives us new birth. Not Jesus. Jesus is the means, but the Holy Spirit is the agent who brings us new birth. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Listen. Jesus answered and said to him, this is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. That night that Nicodemus comes to him, we know John 3, 16. This is part of that conversation. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, well, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? I mean, that's a very reasonable question. Be born again. How do you do that? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's discussion about what does he mean by being born of water? Water. Some believe that means talking about baptism, being born through the water of baptism. I believe, as some do, that it's talking about natural birth. When a baby is born, what happens first? What happens with water? The water's broken. The baby is born through water. Unless you're born of water, unless you have a natural birth, come to life, 
and born of the Spirit, that's the new birth, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's why I think the water's talking about being born naturally into this world. That which is born of flesh is flesh. You're born into this world as a fleshly human being. That's what you are. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed, I said to you. You must be born again. Listen, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. Can I say this? And you see the results of it. I can witness to that. <laughs> you see the results of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. Amen. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You don't know where the Spirit came from. And you don't understand exactly how He's moving. But you know He is there. And we're born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of our salvation. He convinces us of sin. He reveals the truth of Jesus. And He is the one who brings us into the kingdom of God, who gives us new birth. We are born of the Spirit. In fact, He incorporates us, brings us into the body of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit, capital S, by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Now, what body is he talking about? The body of Christ. We're all baptized into one body, the body of Christ. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that baptizes or adds us to the body of Christ. We are born again and brought into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. All this happens when the Holy Spirit Spirit, listen to me now, you got to follow me, when the Holy Spirit indwells us. Romans chapter 8 verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, or the King James says, indwells you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong here. So we have to have the Spirit living in us to be born again. Amen? Okay, I'm going to try that one more time. I want to make sure you're following me. We have to have the Spirit of God dwelling in us to be born again. You agree with that? Okay, that's what the scripture says. If the spirit does not belong to you, if, you're not, if he's not in you, you're not a part of Christ. You're not a Christian. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19 says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? So the Holy Spirit leads us to Christ. He convinces us of our need of Jesus for salvation. And the Holy Spirit brings us into the family of God, the body of Christ, the temple of God, whichever way you want to look at it, by giving us spiritual birth as he comes and establishes. Now listen, and the dwelling of his presence in his life. The sacrifice of Jesus made it possible. Why do I say that? Before Jesus' sacrifice took our sin out of the way, the Holy Spirit could not dwell in us. We were the dwelling of evil. We were the dwelling of sin. But the Holy Spirit, remo excuse me, Jesus removed the sin through his sacrifice. He bore our sin on the cross, carried our sin to the depths of hell. So with the sin out of the way, now the Holy Spirit can return. When we died in the Garden of Eden as a, as a humankind, the Spirit of God abandoned us because he could not dwell with sin. But now, the Holy Spirit comes back and he brings our spirit back to life. This is the idea of regeneration, bringing life back to our spiritual man. You ever heard the, the phrase, dead man walking? Dead man walking. It's what they talk about the, uh, the people who are, are on death row in the penitentiary. They're dead men walking. We were dead men walking before Christ. 
because the spirit within us, our spirit was dead, but the Holy Spirit came and breathed life back into our spirit. What happened on the day that God created Adam? Formed him out of the dust of the ground and he breathed life into him. Breathed. What, what, what brought that life? The presence of God in us. But sin drove out that presence. Jesus took away the sin and now the Holy Spirit. When we express and, and demonstrate our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. That's what took place that night in the upper room when Jesus suddenly appeared that night of his resurrection, when he appeared to his disciples in the upper room, peace, oh, settle down, God. it's okay, it's okay, I'm alive, I really am. <sighs> Receive the Holy Spirit. At that moment, they were born again. <laughs> At that moment, the Holy Spirit dwelt within them. And not just those ten men, because Judas was dead. Thomas was absent that night. So there was just ten of the disciples there. It wasn't just those. It was all the believers. He was just symbolizing in his disciples. But it happened to all those who had faith in him. Mary and Martha weren't there that night. But I believe when Jesus received the Holy Spirit. I believe that breath reached Mary and Martha. I believe that breath reached blind Bartimaeus that day, wherever he was at. I, and many others that had put their faith in Jesus. That night, there was a born again experience that happened in there. Are you born again today? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? I pray you have. If so, then I want you to know the Holy Spirit indwells your life right now. If not, if you're not born again, I can tell you today you can be born again by simply putting your faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit indwelling us, receiving the Holy Spirit. But apparently, that wasn't all there was. Because Jesus, probably several times over that 40 days, but specifically on that last day that he was with them, said, now wait, don't leave Jerusalem, stay right here. Because you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They'd already received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, now you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Something beyond being born again. If it weren't true, why would Jesus say, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now? Why would he tell them, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for what the Father has promised. If they'd already received the Holy Spirit, they were already born again, and clearly they were. Why would he tell them to wait if there wasn't something more? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not the same as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we are born again. These are two different things. Church, I'm telling you this because I did not grow up in Pentecost. I did not grow up in the Assemblies of God in Pentecost at all. I grew, grew, up, grew up in a general Baptist church. And though I had heard about different things in the Pentecostal church, I didn't know the doctrines of teaching. And when I began to be shown this, and, and this, this teaching began, to, this scripture, it's not like somebody was trying to brainwash me. They were telling me what's right here in the Word of God. Begin to open things up to my mind and to my heart. There is something beyond just being born again called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, also called the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, several things, and we'll see some of that today. But I want to look at two other passages. You say, okay, Pastor Mike, that's one passage of Scripture. The Bible says 